Okay, <laughs> we'll continue uh, about inflammatory disease and other diseases around the shoulder. Uh, so why don't we start with Pavan here? Um, so this looks like a shoulder. Um, okay, so T1 doesn't look too impressive. Here's the sterile. Okay, so there's like diffuse um, kind of linear edema throughout the muscle, uh, throughout the length. And there's the T1 facet post. So, enhancement and edema throughout the... What's your first question? Where's the T1 facet grip? Yeah. You can't read enhancement unless you have a... Oh, right, right. Say yeah. T1 facet free is post, otherwise... As we've seen, we can have a lot of false positives. So there's a T1 fat set pre, of course, that's in a different plane, and there's a T1 fat set post. So, what do you think is going on here? So, it looks like there's edema or enhancement of the kind of like probably around the muscle okay. fascicles. You can see here on that stir. That there is edema. This is definitely, yeah. you see stirs all the time. That's not what muscle looks like. We can see that there, now we know this is enhancement. Yeah. Uh, there's kind of a streaky enhancement. And there we can see kind of the streaky nature of the enhancement, but a little bit more diffuse. But these are all kind of all the muscles in the area, or most of them are, are abnormal here. Mm -hmm. and, are you uh, away from the mic, Mark? Yeah, I am. Yeah. That's right. Thanks, John. I, I apologize. I am away from the mark of the mic. So, uh, uh, Pavan, what do you think is going on here? I think it's probably uh, looks like multiple muscles are involved. So, like polymyositis or something of that sort. Yeah. So, or dermatomyositis. This is dermatomyositis. Uh, so it really looks like inflammatory disease. Uh, it it's a little it's awfully diffuse to be. Uh, and infectious, uh, certainly if it's strep or staph or something like that, to have this diffuse disease, the patient's really going to be sick. Uh, and you'd probably start seeing abscesses with this and so forth, which we don't see, or we don't really see any abscesses here. But what we see really is edema and enhancement kind of diffusely along the strands of the different muscle fibers. And that's pretty typical of dermatomyositis. And, uh, kind of primary inflammatory changes of, of muscles. All right, 15-year-old male, shoulder and thigh pain. So we have fluid-sensitive sequences here. There's diffusely increased signal throughout all the musculature. So this is either, this is post-contrast? There is. This is 15 year old, diffuse uh, muscle pain, diffuse. Let's see, let me just. I'm pretty sure this is the same patient, but. He's trying to show like it was resolved. Actually, you know, I think probably what this is. No. No. Uh, 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 uh. Well, I, I can't be entirely sure here, but this is these are probably T1 fat sat posts. Okay. And these are probably PD fat sat images. And then here, these are these are T2 and PD images uh, here in the axial plane. Okay. So it looks like diffuse uh, myositis or rhabdomyositis? It's a little, a little spotty, which you can get, but it looks very symmetric. And this was juvenile dermatomyositis. Huh. And they uh, biopsied the uh, rectus femoris muscle to get the diagnosis. Okay. Okay. Right shoulder swelling, pain for two days. Okay, radiographs. Um, 
Nothing's jumping out at me here. Okay, CT the chest. On the right, maybe there's this hypotenuating muscle there. Is, um, yeah, is it the supraspinatus? Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's I, yeah, it's lower I'm density. This. Okay. Now an MR scan. I presume is what you want. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the supraspinatus on this T two is damitus, just diffusely. So the that's that's the infra. There's maybe some fluid along the infraspinase as well, and yeah, in the deltoid. Hmm. And uh, contrast enhancement, yes. Uh, more medially there, yeah. And a bone scan. We yeah, we see diffuse uptake in the muscles. Probably bilaterally here. Mm -hmm. The bilateral obviously is important. If it were unilateral, just with the supra and, and infra, what would you be thinking? Bilateral bone scan uptake or just involvement? Uh, edema. Oh, edema? Oh. I, I, I don't know. I guess, yeah, just an inflammatory myositis, maybe, or... Okay, so oh. this patient had rhabdomyolysis. Oh, this was PK, yeah. <laughs> okay, and you can see the sky-high uh, labs. Yeah. Okay. That's so where we have a 49-year-old with pain on methotrexate and prednisone, no fever or chills. Looks like there's a lot of edema primarily in the infraspinatus muscle And there's some, yeah, looks like that's all infra. And there's some there the tendon as well. Mm -hmm. That's some fluid. And see some bone edema here. Yeah. And this, this patient uh, uh, had eosinophilic fasciitis. Interesting. So it's typically made by biopsy where you see a lot of eosinophils. And it's, it's really a a uh, type of uh, uh, allergic reaction, or an inflammatory reaction, which are primarily eosinophils, which are typically associated with allergic type of, uh, reactions. And it can be focal, but it can also be very diffuse. Okay. So, with an adeltoid, we see uh, kind of focal linear edema on that lateral aspect. Yeah. yeah. And then there's some joint fluid as well. Um, so it looks like it's involving certain muscle fibers. Um, Yeah, I'm not really sure what the patient had recent surgery. And this is an arthroscopic board. Okay. So I want to go on and talk a little bit about uh, frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis. Uh, some people say there are three st stages. Some people say there. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. So what we're looking for basically is a, a edema, acute edema. Uh, typically, and then also effacement of the fat in the rotator cuff interval and capsular thickening, especially the middle glenohumeral ligament and inferior glenohumeral ligaments, uh, which you're all familiar with because you've all seen it 100 times so far this year uh, looking at MR scans. Some people say three, some people say four stages. Uh, typically, what's in the literature is stage one, Lasts from zero to three months. You're left with you have pain and limited range of motion. Stage two, 
is at three to nine months, where you get a lot of thickening of the infraglenohumeral ligament and uh, uh, medial uh, glenohumeral lig uh, uh, middle glenohumeral ligament. Stage three is about nine to 15 months, where the pain starts getting decreased, but you still have a lot of, a lot of limitation from motion. And stage four is typically 15 to 24 months, where you get better range of motion. And 85% uh, of these become basically normal function. Though on careful physical examination, a lot of them may be left with mild loss of range of motion, but they are, uh, pretty much do pretty well. Stages of one or two, if you biopsy it, they're showing increasing levels of synovitis with, within the joint space. Uh, let's see. Hasten. All right. So it's like we have uh, two axial slices showing capsular edema, like middle glenohumeral and inferior glenohumeral ligaments. Well, uh, a little too low to see the middle. Okay. Uh, and well, we're really a little bit underneath. This is basically the, that inferior recess area. And so this is a lot of uh, edema around the inferior capsule. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's, that's kind of pretty severe capsular edema. Most of the time we don't see it quite that severe. Uh, other things we look for uh, is uh, looking at the uh, rotator uh, the rotator cuff interval, as you know, this is going to be the capsule here, uh, subscapularis recess there, coracoid process, superior margin of the subscap muscle, uh, and this is the biceps tendon. And here we have the coracoid humeral ligament coming across in this area. And there's a triangle here that you're all well aware of, which should be predominantly made of fat in this area. You, get, you can get a little bit of uh, thickening right along the, the uh, capsule margin here. Uh, now this is the kind of recommended location. And on the axial plane, you can see it as a little bit of thickening here right along the capsule. Uh, it can also go all, along the superior part of the capsule as well here. <clears throat> uh, but uh, with increasing degrees, you can get it also along the cocohumeral ligament, and you can fill the entire triangle here. Uh, replacing the fat with inflammatory tissue. So, uh, as we can see here in this article from uh, Mingardi, you can also see this area on ultra noise and this uh, in particular area there, though we don't. Uh, uh, John Reed is from Australia where they use a lot of ultrasound and diagnosis. Here, we, we really don't use ultrasound much for this, this particular diagnosis. Um, this is in Korea. Uh, where if, if you don't have MR, you can also use ultrasound. Here you can see injection of contrast in the old days, pre-MR days, and even pre-ultrasound days. You do arthrography, and you'd find that there you'd have a very small joint capsule here, uh, uh, markedly constrained. In fact, one of the old treatments was to do an arthrogram and then over-inject the shoulder to try to break up the adhesions. Uh, I think now, typically, we see that they're really not adhesions like was thought at that particular time. So my concern now, looking back at those days, is that uh, I'm not sure that we actually opened up the capsule or basically uh, extravasated the contrast. But I don't think this is a common treatment for it uh, anymore. Kind of uh, started back... Uh, uh, back in uh, 1872, and then... The term adhesive capsulitis came around in 1945. Codman, uh, Codman Triangle fame, uh, also uh, wrote about this disease in the, in the 1930s. Uh, <clears throat> their uh, definition is it's basically considered a clinical diagnosis based upon kind of the time frames and physical examination and patient symptoms discussed earlier. It tends to have an insidious onset of stiffness to begin with. Then pain, uh, typically at night, uh, near complete loss of passive and active external rotation. Uh, and uh, nearly all patients recover, uh, but uh, may not always get the normal range of motion. Uh, it's uh, uncommon before the age of 40. 
picks in the sixth decade as women are much more commonly involved uh, than men, uh, and the other shoulder becomes infected uh, uh, not uncommonly. Uh, treatment is uh, still very much controversial. Uh, a lot of people will inject the shoulder with uh, steroids and physical therapy. Uh, some people say the steroids are to try to decrease the symptoms and allow physical therapy to kind of stretch it out because it's very painful if you don't do something to help uh, relieve the pain. And in severe cases, you can do arthroscopic release. Uh, John, what are your thoughts about how did you treat this disease? Uh, I treated it with uh, tender, loving care. Yeah. Uh, the main thing is that probably the first visit I would inject with cortisone. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, I, I would advise the patient uh, to relax and uh, don't move too much. Okay. And then after that, uh, then gentle motion and uh, use heat or uh, in most cases. And uh, I would have the patient visit me on a very frequent basis, maybe once a week, maybe two, two weeks, and uh, just keep reassuring the patient that they're going to be okay. okay. And uh, that. That's about it. Uh, now, when it gets to, to the last stage, uh, when, when uh, you're not getting the results you want, you, did one, right? you may want to emo uh, um, uh, uh, put the patient under anesthesia and manipulate the shoulder. Um, yeah. That's the last resort. Uh, the, the main thing is you, the way you manipulate it is never you, you go to the elbow to manipulate. You, go, you manipulate right under the armpit, um, and, and then you feel a crack, hmm. and it scares the hell out of you. Uh, the patient's asleep, so it doesn't scare them, but you feel like you just broke a bone. Which occasionally uh, happens. But what you what what happens is you break through that capsule, and then you put the patient's arm in a, a, a superior position, uh, sort of like uh, the Aver view, view type of position, and uh, you may even use traction for it, and wait for a couple of days and um, start uh, either physical therapy or gentle. Um, usually you, you can advise the patients how to do the, the motion and uh, try to get the motion back very, very so slowly. Okay. But the main thing is don't push the patient um, hard. The, 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 the women at that age are premenopausal, and that's probably the reason they come down with this condition. Um, it, it, that's probably, it, that's why we don't see it in men very often, but I've seen enough, um, even in athletes, uh, that, that uh, it, it's around in men as well. Yeah. And here, this here, uh, Dr. Sue just says some people believe that they have three f uh, phases, uh, but you know it's basically can the whole thing can last uh, uh, two to three years before they get uh, resolution, full recovery in about 40 40 percent of patients. Most people have recovery to relatively good function, about eighty percent, um, or in this case they say fifty four percent and with some uh, residual f functional limitations. And then now also the other thing besides uh, uh, manipulation under anesthesia, uh, uh, a lot of people now are also doing arth arthroscopic uh, uh, surgery to free up the adhesions. I've, I've never used it. And, uh, I mean, I've never done it arthroscopically, never had a patient at that time. Yeah. Uh, the most common association with this is diabetes. In fact, it can occur up to a third of patients who have diabetes. 
uh, and it's the diabetes also is a poor prognostic factor. They tend to have less of a chance of getting back to full recovery. It's also associated with thyroid disease, uh, adrenal uh, insufficiency, Parkinson's, cardiac disease, pulmonary, and stroke. Okay. Uh, so, uh, there could be some kind of a nerve uh, involvement as well. Uh, I... Yeah, I, th I think anything that, that limits uh, range of motion, if people stay, uh, and, and if they're people who are prone to this disease have any condition which uh, decreases their activities so they limit the uh, normal motion of the shoulder, it can lead to uh, to frozen shoulder. It's a risk factor for it. Okay, so history of frozen shoulder, sagittal T2, looking at the rotator interval, we see effacement of the normal fat. So there's a little bit of effacement here, and in the PD fat set images, we can actually see that there's some uh, 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 inhomogeneous tissues with some edema in there. On the axial images, which is another good image to look for this, we can see effacement of the fat. And the rotator cuff interval here, here's the capsule, and here you can see the rotator cuff interval, and this should be predominantly fat in this patient. If, if one, one thing about this uh, condition is that you, you get to the end stage where they're almost fully recovered, so-called, um, but if you examine the patient very carefully, you find that there is decrease in some emotion. Uh, I, by taking the arms internally, rotate them, and try to bring both hands up, what happens is one hand will not go up as far as the other one. And uh, that, that, that I, I learned to do that and uh, found that almost none of them came back to 100%. Okay, thanks, John. Okay. That's just my experience. Yeah. All right, so looking at the sub coracoid triangle again there's looks looks like there's some effacement of that fat and posterior yeah, so here we can see that there's a capsule which is thickened and we are obliterating the margins of the capsule here we can see obliteration of the margins of the coracohumeral ligament up in this area i think part of the symptoms may well be that this often has adhesions to the to the long head of the biceps tendon uh, and we know that's a very tender area uh, there, so this is uh, effacement of the fat and the rotator cuff interval. Uh, so then, then you need to, the next thing you need to look at is the inferior capsule and the middle glenohumeral ligaments, and then uh, typically with frozen shoulder, you'll have a paucity of fluid in the joint space, and that's kind of the MR findings we look for to suggest this diagnosis. But again, it's it's really still a, a clinical diagnosis, but it's it's actually quite common. And I think there are many years there where a radiologist grossly under underdiagnosed this condition because we just weren't aware of these findings being associated with it. I had a patient in the desert that, uh, that I had an MRI on, on the patient, and, uh, and uh, he was actually getting better. He was a professional golfer, and uh, he was improving, but not fast enough, so we took an MRI and uh, we saw a little bit of a um, interstitial um, degenerative change in the supraspinatus tendon, so okay. we thought we had an interstitial tear. Right. Um, and uh, you, you looked at the MRIs, and uh, then then I decided to do a, a one would die, and uh, the same thing showed up. Yeah, we, we never. I don't remember if we saw any increase in 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 what you're looking at now. Okay. Uh, and and um, so I thought the patient. We decided to send the patient to the shoulder arthroscopist. And uh, 
he was a hand surgeon as well. And he didn't find anything, but well, of course, it was interstitial, so he wouldn't. Well, yeah. But the patient wanted it done, so we, I sent him over to have it done. Okay. So, but so. Uh, here, here again, all, all emotion except maybe 5% or 10%. Ah. 10%. Hmm. Okay, so here we can see the effacement of the fat in the rotator cuff interval in the sagittal plane. This is that same patient where we can see the effacement of the fat in the rotator cuff interval in the axial plane and mark capsular thickening. Okay, Yvonne? Okay, so we're looking at a uh, sagittal view, and again, we see effacement of the rotator interval fat. And uh, this is another patient who had classic frozen shoulder. Mother-in-law, local orthopedic surgeon, okay. Um, yeah, there is a uh, effacement of the fat at the rotator interval. Okay. And then on the axial images. Yeah, we could see that same region as a phase. So this is really a... Uh... Uh, capsulitis. So I think it's what we're seeing here with this is really uh, scarring from a chronic capsulitis. The cause of the capsulitis uh, is debated. There, there are probably multiple causes, not a single cause, but uh, certainly associated with diabetes and uh, anything that produces a lack of motion of the shoulder is an increased risk. And then in women, as John was saying, which may be hormonal. Okay. I think that diabetes probably makes everything worse. Yeah, right. Including cancer. Yeah. Okay, so here, is this an arthrogram? Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, an arthrogram. This is actually was a CT arthrogram. This is what the injection looks like. Mm -hmm. And this is a very small capsule. It's not filling out like you would expect. You don't really see much of a inferior recess here. Here's the CT scan. Right, there's not a lot of filling of the, the glenohumeral joint. Yeah, it's just a little extravasation of contrast here. Mm -hmm. Here's the MR scan. Um, yeah, it looks like here is thickening of the, the inferior capsule. Yeah, marked thickening, a little bit of edema within that inferior capsule. Mm -hmm. Here are the axial image. Um, yeah, that anterior portion of the capsule looks thickened. Yeah, so this is the middle glenohumeral ligament. It's markedly thickened here and mm -hmm. abnormal in morphology and signal intensity both. And then go to the rotator cuff interval. We can see again a facement of the fat within the rotator cuff interval. And then go down below. This is where the middle glenohumeral ligament, if you remember the anatomy, kind of fuses with the deep tissue of the, or the posterior tissue of the subscap. And it's kind of all socked in here. And this is a, a severe capsulitis involving going down to the inferior capsule. And this is a case of severe frozen shoulder. And it's a paper from Skeletal Radiology showing that capsular thickening and enhancement, we typically don't give contrast for this. Uh, the capsular thickening does correlate very well with limited range of motion and pain. All right, so we have a 21-year-old uh, pro plant tennis player rule out impingement or labral tear. Uh, let's see, looking at the inferior capsule looks thick and a little edematous there as well. And the uh, outlet looks pretty normal here. Yes. Uh, I'll throw in one more thing, John, if I may. Yes. Uh, uh, but these patients... Uh, they remind me a lot of sympathetic dystrophy. And um, when they're not moving, they're not hurting for the most part. Okay. But when they start to move, they hurt. And so they don't move. And that's how you start propagating the problem with the freezing. So okay. what you have to do is you have to give them very gentle exercise program 
and and that's the way you start the treatment and the heat. Uh, but the, the, if you push it, like I said, like sympathetic dystrophy, you get into trouble. Okay. Or the patient gets into trouble. Right. So so here we both. can, yeah. So here we see marked thickening of that inferior capsule. In this case, uh, uh, here we can again. This is just the axial images through that inferior capsule region. Here we can see that. Uh, uh, there is, we don't have the typical scarring, but there is some irregular tissue here, maybe some edema within that uh, rotator cuff interval. Uh, <clears throat> but this is a 21 year old uh, player. John said earlier that uh, athletes can get this as well. You know, she has very good muscle development here. And so uh, the question is, is this the typical frozen shoulder or is this a form of capsulitis which can come from repetitive trauma? And again, the differential when you see this thickened internal uh, inferior capsule is trauma, previous tear of that inferior glenohumeral ligament or repetitive trauma. You can see that in people who have uh, repetitive anterior dislocations where they probably have tearing, just like we see in other areas where you get tears of capsules, ligaments, and tendons. When it heals, it can become very thickened. Or is this due to a chronic uh, uh, inflammatory reaction, and I think in some younger uh, athletes, it may be a residual of trauma rather than a classic 56-year-old uh, uh, female with frozen shoulder. i never see, seen a case at 21 years of age, John. Yeah. Everybody I've ever seen was over 40. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uncommon. And here's just another case where you can see marked thickening of that anterior capsule, probably involving some of the middle and with the middle glenohumeral ligament here, and this particular patient who had frozen shoulder. Okay, who's next? Is it me? Um, so we see some thickening. I think that maybe the uh, might be at the level of the middle glenohumeral ligament, or is it just an anterior capsule? Right. Yeah. So this again is mark thickening of that anterior capsule and middle glenohumeral ligament. Okay. Uh, which we can see goes all the way up here to where we have those multiple structures which come together that we talked about in the anatomy portion, uh, and and through here. And uh, John, I, I believe you told me that in the orthopedic textbook, uh, uh, they talk a lot about thickening of the middle glenohumeral ligament, uh, more so than the inferior capsule or the rotator cuff interval. Is that correct? Um, I I cannot really answer that question, John. Yeah, I think but the capsule uh, is thickened, so you would assume that the other yeah. parts of the capsule, which is the anterior ligaments. Uh, of the shoulder will will increase in size. Yeah, I think you remember. I remember you saying in years past that that was one of the prominent things that they talked about in the arthroscopic uh, section in uh, in Campbell's. I believe. Right. Okay. Okay. Um... So, I think our inferior glenohumeral ligament looks a little edematous, maybe mildly thickened as well. Mm -hmm. A little uh, bit there, right? We have some effacement of rotator interval, and then we have some joint fluid that, uh... Yeah. Right. What do you think this thing is up here? What is that thing? It's above the labrum. Um, yeah, so at fluoroscopy, this was calcified. And then yeah, next to cool. it, what we see is... Just like inflammatory soft yeah, tissue? Normally, you should see a nice sharp margin of the, of the capsule here. Yeah. There. And this 
happen immediately and uh, it was extremely painful and she had difficulty even getting in and out of bed uh, because just the motion necessary to get out of bed caused the shoulder to be extremely painful. If we look on the sagittal images, the only thing we can really see here is kind of thickening. It looks like synovial thickening here of that posterior superior capsule. Okay. Right in that area there, right in through here. And uh, two days before this, she had no symptoms whatsoever. Um, uh, not, I wouldn't, uh, I'm sorry, but I, I would think of a tear. Yeah. Uh, well, or, uh, you, know, you like say I, that happened after arthroscopy? No, the, this patient has never had arthroscopy. Uh -huh. She had no trauma. It just happened basically one day when she kind of woke up in the morning. She just had severe shoulder pain and severe pain moving it. So we put her in the MR scanner, saw this, uh, and uh, I didn't actually notice that she might have had any calcium. I, I saw this little thickening here, uh, but I, I didn't uh, really think at that time in terms of calcium. So I uh, sent her over and Rob injected her shoulder. And at the time of injecting the shoulder with steroids, he saw this calcification and she was extremely, had a lot of difficulty getting on the table to be positioned to do it because of pain. He injected her shoulder with steroids. She got up off the table and has been asymptomatic ever since. <laughs> a little bit like the kind of miracle I had when I was injected uh, for uh, uh, when I got inflammatory disease of the lower spine. Uh, spine. But anyway, this is this is calcific capsulitis and huh. uh, in, in her and uh, the, the steroid inject and cu cured it and she's not been symptomatic since. So this, this is uh, the, the, the kind of calcium that's uh, uh, like water. Uh, uh, the calcifications come in different right. uh, forms and, and the hard ones you can see very easy, but this one just looks like something that looks fluid-like, and, uh, mm -hmm. and but it's very irritating, and, and that's what causes the pain. Okay. It's, it's, it's extremely irritating, like uh, well, uh, like gouty uh, crystals. Yeah. Your next one. Um, you just said okay. okay. Sorry. Okay, 59-year-old female, rule out adhesive capsulitis. Uh, the sagittal T2 on the left shows effacement of the rotator interval fat. Uh, also on the axial the PD fat side, we see effacement of the rotator interval fat. Oh, there's... This may be injection. This may be a T1 fat set. Okay. Down the rim. I see a little bit of a yeah. signal there. Hmm. So that's on 321-2013. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if we go back, uh, this is seven. So this is 2013, and this is the same patient on 09. Yeah, the fat in the rotator interval looks a lot cleaner. Um, so, yeah, maybe she developed. Yeah, adhesive capsulitis, maybe. Yeah. Uh, what this was, was the, con the concentration of the contrast they put in was too concentrated. Okay. Oops. Shoot. What's going on? Why did you do that? And this is actually uh, artificially low in signal intensity because this is a T2-weighted sagittal image, and the contrast was not diluted. Okay. So, just to remind you of that uh, problem that that we talked about at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Probably happens more often than we know. All right. Uh, so we think about that. Then 
the best thing, well, if you're seeing them right away, let's see them, or you can see them a couple days later, I guess you can bring them back, put them on the table, it's a few hours later, it's diluted enough where you're going to get a normal marcher ground. So we have a 44 year old female, left shoulder pain for two years, shoulder swelling for several months. Don't know that I see a whole lot here. Yeah, maybe a big deltoid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it looks like there's a lot of fluid and a lot of bodies in that subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Uh, yeah, some more of that fluid and debris and some bodies in there. Uh, yeah. That's what it looks like right at the plate. Is that, uh, See, this was, uh, well, so what's the diagnosis? It's like a synovial chondromatosis or? No, it would be osteochondromatosis. Well, it's not really calcified very well on the plane films, John. Oh, but, they, I, I take it back. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Okay. But I should be able to see it on that. Well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard here. Uh, there's a little bit of modeled density here. This doesn't really look like the normal muscle density if you look at it carefully. Uh, especially in it certainly muscles. doesn't. Uh, it's, it looks like there's soiling. Yeah, so here you can see this is the muscle, and there's a fair amount of fat within the muscle. This is actually, if you look at it carefully, it's all fluid and these little loose bodies right in through here that are in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Easier to see on the MR. Okay, so... We have some coronal images with some flattening of the humeral head and it's uh, some subchondral cystic changes. There's a high riding humeral head and then there's similar changes at the glenoid. So I'd be maybe worried about some like, uh, like a neuropathic issue. Like, uh, if, you, if you try to think about that. Uh, generally with neuropathic, you'll get a lot of kind of fragments of bone around uh, possible. This is really kind of cl classic kind of in-stage osteoarthritis with subchondral cystic changes. The articular cartilage is gone here. So it's uh, a diffuse grade four chondromalacia. And uh, so it's just, uh, it's called osteoarthritis, though at this stage, there's really not a lot of inflammatory disease here. This is I prefer to call it more degenerative disease. I think it's more of a mechanical problem with loss of articular cartilage rather than an inflammatory problem. But people still call it osteoarthritis. I like degenerative arthritis. I like better. Yeah, I agree with you. I do too. And here's just another example. Large marginal osteophytes, uh, big subchondral cystic changes, disruption of the subchondral bone, grade four chondromalacia, and then more severe stages you see remodeling of the articular surfaces. They're not the normal configuration. You get more, much more flattening of the humeral head, which can lead to kind of chronic change, uh, chronic uh, 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 limited range of motion because you no longer have the normal anatomy at the articular surface. And there's a classification for the morphologic changes. You can see a degenerative disease within the shoulder, uh, which we see here. <clears throat> a lot of these degenerative changes may be due in part to congenital anomalies, uh, which uh, some of these we can see here that we've talked a little bit about uh, before. Uh, and then you can see sometimes you'll have abnormal centering of the humeral head with abnormal wear patterns. And one of the most common ones is this B2 common uh, uh, problem back here. And some of the uh, shoulder replacement surgeons are interested in this classification, the Waltz classification, uh, especially the B2 is a pretty f uh, common cause uh, 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 that, that, that's seen. And we can see the, uh, the abnormal uh, morphology of the, of the glenoid. So it's, uh, I typically don't use this classification 
uh, but uh, uh, it is a good idea to describe these morphological changes when you see them, because if, especially if you have deficiencies in the normal anatomy, which may lead to insufficiency. Con contact sports and probably any kind of sports to uh, a f far degree uh, are probably responsible more than anything or hard work. Yeah. Uh, Who's next? Our chronic shoulder pain. So let's see, we have grave or cartilage loss and joint space loss uh, with subchondral cysts and edema and sclerosis. And there is an effusion uh, and a giant loose body in the subcortical. Right. Now that's pro but probably going to be an enlarged sub. Uh, scapularis okay. uh, space rather than a subcoracoid space. I think we're still above the coracoid process here. Okay. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> I think that back, but I still think it's in an enlarged sub subcoracoid uh, bursa here uh, rather than in a, I mean, I mean in a uh, subscapularis bursa. I think it's part of the joint space and uh, it's a loose body f from within the joint rather than outside the joint space which is where the subcoracoid bursa would be. Okay. Yeah, so a calcified loose body, very typical appearance and cross-section of these body with these large chronic loose bodies. They grow, they, they start out kind of small flecks of, of bone or cartilage, they ossify, and then over the years they grow, and they typically have these very irregular margins like this called a Roman coin appearance. Okay, chronic shoulder pain. Um, yeah, there's a deformity of the humeral head. It looks like um, just, yeah, this erosive type change. Remodeling, um, joint effusion. Uh, could this be, and there's a lot of muscle atrophy. Yeah, this is loose. Atrophy. Loose bodies in the joint space. Um, yeah, just severe degeneration, but maybe sort of like a neurogenic degeneration. So, what would you ask for next? A C spine or MRI, yeah. Um, yeah, we see uh, degeneration of the spinal cord, a severe degenerative disease of the. Uh, my little mark central stenosis, and then you have a, mm -hmm. um, a central uh, cyst in the cord. So it's going to have the disease. Okay. And treatment of severe osteoarthrosis really uh, is uh, the, the, the only real treatment that's effective really when, when they get to a point where either the pain is too much or they, they lose function as a joint replacement. Uh, uh, to, to really be able to do a good joint replacement, you really need to have a functioning deltoid. So as we've talked about when we've read out cases, it's important when you have degenerative disease of the, of the glenohumeral joint space to make sure you talk about the integrity of the, of the deltoid. It's, uh, it's critically important in deciding the kind of surgery. The rotator cuff uh, tendons are also important, uh, but uh, you can have large rotator cuff tears in these uh, reverse, I mean, uh, this is not a reverse, but you can then go to reverse uh, prostheses here, uh, and they can function well as long as you have a good deltoid, even if you don't have a, uh, a good rotator cuffs. Uh, if most of the anatomy is intact, then an anatomic type reconstruction can can be very effective. Uh, they have more stability than the other, and they don't wear out. I I know a fellow, uh, well, a patient of mine, that had bilateral reverse shoulders, and he played pretty good golf. Yeah. So uh, that's. Uh, uh, that's a pretty good procedure. Good. I don't know who, who invented it. I don't remember. 
Yeah. And then uh, you can just do hemiarthroplasties, uh, which where if the glenoid is in good shape, you can just put in a prosthesis in the, the femoral head if you have severe proximal fractures, osteoarthritis when the glenoid is involved. Uh, and uh, as we can see here, I've done, I've done my share of those. Yeah. Uh, if you have severe glenoid bone loss, you may not be able to put a cup in the, in the glenoid. So uh, sometimes they, they will just do a hemiarthroplasty in those cases. Contraindications if you have anterior superior instability, these don't work. If you have inadequate soft tissue support, predominantly a, a, fun, a non functioning deltoid. And then uh, if the glenoid is really abnormal, uh, you have problems with it. If you, the, if you do the hemiarthroplasties with only one side, the functional outcome's not quite as good, not as good as a, as a total, and that they also end up having increased revision rates. Uh, total hemiarthroplasties were basically if you have pain from chronic osteoarthritis. Yes? He's able to come up right now. Okay, why don't we, uh, let's stop here and we'll, we'll start uh, at this point uh, uh, tomorrow. Okay, thanks. thanks. I mean Thursday. Thursday, I mean, thank you, John. Correct, I mean Thursday. Have a good one. Thank you.